Hello and welcome to The God Delusion. Just kidding, this is episode 7 of the Pan Psycast. Today we are going to be looking at St. Anselm and the ontological argument. St. Anselm of Canterbury was born in the 11th century and was an outstanding Christian philosopher and theologian. He is most famous for the ontological argument, an a priori deductive argument for the existence of God. Today we're going to be looking at that argument, its strengths and its weaknesses, um, and picking it apart as usual. <laughs> okay. Alright, so in part one we're looking at Anselm and the arguments, in part two, Guanillo and the island, part three, objections, and part four, further analyses and discussion. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes, uh, and it's P-A-N-P-S-Y-C-A-S-T, that's the Pan Psycast. We're going to do what we always do, let's go. Welcome once again to the Pan Psychas. I'm joined by Andrew Horton. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure about that? <laughs> Hello. I'm, I'm joined by Mr. Andrew Horton and Mr. Ollie Marley as well. Hello. Superb. Good to have you both here again for another fantastic episode of the Pan Psychas. St. Anselm and the ontological argument. Who is St. Anselm before we kick off and jump right into it? Jack, Ollie, and Andy investigate. So, maybe, maybe give a bit of background information on who, who he was. So, St. Anselm, born in the 11th century, was an Italian Benedictine monk. Um, also ended up being the Archbishop of Canterbury um, for um, a period of time as well. So, a very um, well thought of, quite important uh, Christian theologian and philosopher. Um, the ontological argument is his key work and it's very influential, I would say. Well, ont- ontological, what's this fancy word mean, Andy? <laughs> it's another fancy word uh well weirdly and i guess it's quite a good uh order in which we've done these episodes because kant is the guy who actually gave the name of the ontological argument to uh to anselm's argument so it wasn't actually referred to that until kant brought it up but it's the ontology is the like, study of the nature of being or or existence when we're when we're talking about anselm so anselm's trying to prove god's being god's existence through uh a priori logic? <laughs> a priori logic. So what's a priori mean it's from the Latin, isn't it? So what's it actually translate into a priori? So a priori means um, something you can uh, deduce through reason. So you don't need any empirical evidence for it. You don't need to see it. You don't need to observe it. It's just something that you can prove using reason. Um, we've looked at and mentioned it before, um, but in terms of your in terms of your notes and your definitions, it's probably worth saying and stating that a priori is kind of uh, reason, and a posteriori is um, your empirical evidence and looking at the world and making a, a conclusion through that. Yeah. Um, so, so two different methods of which you can kind of argue or deduce conclusions about the world. Yeah, and in the 11th century, um, not even not even just for theology, the general like philosophical worldview, what most of the kind of top thinkers would have been doing, it was a priori. That was just the way in which you tried to make sense of the world. Um, so for Anselm, this wasn't like, we, it's kind of easy that we can kind of think of it and think, why, why on earth would he take this approach? Well, this was just the way in which you kind of did theology. So it's, it totally makes sense why he would kind of come up with this argument in the way he has. Good. Yeah. So we've done a prior arguments before we did Plato, who tried to figure out the nature of the world, the entire world through a priori reasoning. We've done Descartes, cogito et cosum, I think therefore I am, through a priori reasoning. And we've looked at Aristotle and Aquinas, who were looking at a posteriori understandings of the world. So, and Ollie's exactly right. A priori means before experience and a posteriori means after the experience. So what can you understand about the world before and after? And we're looking at the former, the a priori today. So um, before we jump into part one, we need to know what an argument is, and we're looking at deductive arguments. So, Ollie, do you want to give us a breakdown on what exactly this this means? Sure. So deductive reasoning is just a, a, a framework or a structure that you use to argue something. Um, so I guess deductive arguments are probably one of the most straightforward kinds of argument you can use. Um, so we'll give a really, really simple example here. We can say that... Um, uh, Oh, wait, hang on. Do you want to talk about the idea of a premise first, or like a predicate, or not? Yeah, let's unpack all of the words, because we will be using them a decent amount. Yeah. Sure. So, Andy, do you want to tell us what a predicate is? Yeah, a predicate is basically a factor of what you are describing. So, if you're describing anything, a predicate is just 
uh, like a quality of that. So if I was to describe, uh, well, let's, I'll just describe Ollie as he's right in front of me, um, that he's, so he's wearing a blue hoodie, a, a red t-shirt, he's wearing glasses, he's got spiky purple hair. Um, <laughs> these are all predicates <laughs> of, of like what I'm describing. So that's, that's kind of where we're, we're stood with that. Let's so use an example. Day. One is that all human beings are mammal. <laughs> mammals. <laughs> so yeah. if human, all human beings are mammals, okay? I am human. And therefore your conclusion can be, I'm a mammal. Right. That's a perfect deductive argument that uses deductive reasoning in a conclusion. So if all the premises are true, then the conclusion has to be true. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the big thing. thing. The conclusion could still be true, but it doesn't follow from the premises. So, Socrates is a man. Yeah. All men are mortals. Socrates is mortal. Yeah. That's yep. not a deductive. So, yeah. perhaps that Socrates isn't a man, but Socrates might still be mortal. He just might not be a man. The conclusion can still hold, but it doesn't follow from the premises. That yeah. And it's true. The better the, the deductive argument. So, if the, if the premise, the first original premise, if it's incredibly strong, then like it just can't be broken like you're you're already kind of proving you know like what it is already and like if that holds truth then it will follow um well all the, all the premises would have to wouldn't they so if you you could pick apart any so there might be a no, there might be like a 50 premises yeah but, that all make yeah. up a conclusion yes but oppose it's probably best to understand it in contrast to an inductive argument sure so mm -hmm. an inductive argument is one which the premises make the conclusion probable rather than true or false um, can we think of an example of an inductive argument? Um, okay, so you could do gravity, maybe. So every time I drop something, it falls on the floor. Well, there must be some kind of force that's pulling it down, because every time I've done it, the same thing has happened. Therefore, the force of gravity is probably likely to exist. Cool. So that doesn't necessarily have to be true or false. The premises don't have to be true or false, and the conclusion true or false. It could just be probable premises and a probable conclusion. Yeah, it's very likely that gravity exists. Yeah. Like, I think a good way to get your head around some of these things is almost to like think of thinking like a crime scene or something like that and kind of the way in which like say an investigator is going to figure out something if they if they're looking around the room and tr like finding clues and piecing it all together then like they would be using largely most of the time they're going to be using inductive reasoning aren't they because they mm -hmm. they have to and they might have a suspicion on who it is so they're going to then try and prove that that person is guilty based on all of the evidence they can piece together it was the as butler <laughs> sorry in the in the attic the <laughs> with the candlestick yeah, exactly. <laughs> which is funny because like like sherlock holmes they're like Every single person always seems to describe him as like the master of deduction. Yeah, that's but he's not. He's actually, not. He just uses he's, inductive. He, he uses inductive reasoning. Really? All yeah. the time. He never uses. Well, no, no. Like he does use both, but actually, most of the things that like give Sherlock Holmes his unique kind of why he's such an interesting character is his inductive reasoning. Yeah. Yeah. Because he true. can he can induce more than other people. I mean, that's a bit of a weird way of putting it. Because it's always that like the like the actual proper police force uh, like looking at all these clues. And trying to piece something together and prove that the person they want to prove, whereas Sherlock always finds some sort of weird, like, create like almost. Ah, there was like, sweat on the bottom of his shoe. Yeah, that like, must mean that he went to this place at twelve o'clock. Yeah, and it, and then and then he builds up this bank of inductive reasoning and then comes to his conclusion. So, all right, there, Governor. There's been a crime around these parts. Now we need to figure out who done it. Right. So we've got a body on the floor. There's some blood near the body. Now, using your inductive reasoning, you need to find out who the blood belongs to. You've also got some bullet shells. Now, also using your inductive reasoning, you need to find out. You need to find out what what bullets those guns come from. Did it come from a handgun? Did it come from a machine gun? Where was that gun bought? Maybe that could help us catch the criminal. Also, was the door locked or was it broken into? These are all inductive examples. <laughs> No 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 Batman Okay Robin we're at the crime scene let's have a look around and see what we can find Holy gunshot to the head Batman there's a gunshot wound in his head Okay that Okay he's got a gunshot wound in his head Now if I have a look at the bullets that looks like a 40 caliber round Not many people around here have that kind of round Okay, let's uh, let's move the body. Oh, look! What can you see, Robin? Oh, Batman! There's a there's a card under there. Okay, it looks like some kind of playing card. Let's have a look. It has 
a clown on it. Oh my god, do you know what that means? It must be the clown prince of crime, the Joker. Using our inductive reasoning, we found out that the person who murdered this man is the Joker. That's Um. a good one, Batman. Well done. (laughs) Good inductive reasoning. Deductive. Inductive. Inductive. That was inductive. Okay. Is there anything deductive you guys can see on the crime scene? Batman, Robin? (laughs) No. (laughs) (laughs) Can either of you deductively reason at all? No. Wait, I no, am the what, world's what greatest that, detective. To uh, deduce. To so, deduce. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so, so um, if you wanted to make it deductive, you could say someone has murdered this man. There's a Joker card underneath it. Therefore, it's the Joker. That, that that's, that's still inductive. More inductive. That's still inductive. But, but so you how, can't use how about um, in the crime scene, can you? Yeah. So how about we go up we to the can, body in the and sense that, okay. so okay, I'll take the I'll take Batman for a second. Okay, there's a body here over here, Robin. Um, let me just set this into a deductive, pure argument made of premises. <laughs> <laughs> right, slow, <Robin>. slow night. <laughs> slow night. <laughs> right, okay. Um, there's a man without a pulse. Uh, that's premise one, Robin. Premise two, a man without a pulse is dead. Conclusion, a man, this man, is without a pulse. And is dead. Yeah, we, we, does that qualify? We already knew that, Batman. Let's get on with the actual crime. <laughs> Holy inductive reasoning, Batman! You're right. Batman away. <laughs> so a bit of a silly example there, but there it kind of shows you the difference between deductive and inductive reasoning. <laughs> yeah, it does. It really does, and in the most unconvoluted way possible. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Part 1. Anselm and the Arguments Our inquiry question, is it a bird? Is it a plane? Or is it the ontological argument? So, the first ontological argument that was fully fledged was asserted by Anselm. He lived in between 1033 and 1109, you already know that. Um, And here's a great quote from the Proslogion. So that's the book which we're using and where you can find the ontological arguments. Suddenly, one night during matins, the grace of God shone on his heart. The whole matter became clear to his mind, and a great joy and jubilation filled his inmost being. Anselm was doing a real early morning prayer. I think matins is something you do at like 3 a.m. or something crazy. And then suddenly he discovered this argument for the existence of God. It just came to him a priori through his reasoning alone. And he understood that God exists, and he could deductively deduce it. It could not be flawed. He can prove the existence of God. Yeah. It might be worth saying as well that obviously many Christians believed in God before the ontological argument, but it's kind of a, a reasoned logical argument to prove God's existence. Um, so you don't need to believe in the ontological argument to believe in God. It's just a argument to prove the existence of God. Should we set out the argument? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do sure. it. Okay. So Anselm says he can prove... Let, let me Let me take the role of Anselm. Okay, to you two, I can prove the existence of God in less than a minute. Shall I see if I can do it? That would be mighty impressive. You have 60 seconds, Alan Salm. Off you go. Okay. God is greater than which nothing greater can be conceived. God exists, at least in the understanding. It's greater to exist in reality, though, than just to exist in understanding. Suppose that God only existed in our understanding, then there will be a being which is greater than God, one that exists in reality. But this is a contradiction. So our assumption was false and God exists in reality. 30 seconds. There you wow, go. Got boom. Too bad, Drop the mic. Yeah. That was, a, that was a 30 second. Let, let's, should, we, should we break it down a little bit just because it's uh, just to put it into my own. Oh, should we put it in the words of Richard Dawkins? Do we, we want to go straight to no, Dawkins? No, no, it's fine. It get, do, at least Dawkins sum, he sums it up quite nicely. Bet you I can... <laughs> so Dawkins from The God Delusion, he sums up Anselm's argument in probably the most non-straw man way possible it really does it justice sir. yeah bet you i can prove god exists bet you can't right then imagine the most perfect 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 thing possible okay now what now is that perfect 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 thing real does it exist no it's only in the mind 
But if it was real, it would be even more perfect, because a really, really perfect thing would have to be better than a silly old imaginary thing. So, I prove that God exists. No, 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 all atheists are fools. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is there, yeah. He, he kind of makes it into that, like, childhood, like, playground kind of petty. No, 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 I'm right, you're wrong. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which... I think, yeah, quite, as you said, probably a bit straw manny. Yeah, what's in, straw man, just so we know. So you build up your argument of the other person in a way that doesn't do them justice. So yeah, you're most, you're like, you present the argument as, like, as sillier than it actually is. You, you're kind of, you give it this fake, kind of, worse version of the argument, and then you, then you knock that down to prove that the logic of the actual argument is bad, but that's not, not a particularly good way because you're not actually engaging with the real argument. You're just coming up with your own silly version of it. Because it's easy to undo and pull apart. Yeah, a you're just man. not doing it justice. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. There. Boom. There we go. There you go. You asked the question like you okay. didn't know as well. You yeah. sly Socrates in the corner. I'm a great liar. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Should we break down the argument? I think so. In a bit more detail. I should say just before we do that, this is an argument reductio ad absurdum. So the idea is you argue the opposite to your conclusion. You follow the conclusion to the end, and then you'll say that that cl- conclusion must be absurd. Um, so if I said um, something like, Ollie is made of fairies, like every part of his body is made of fairies, and then you saw and said, well, that's absurd. Let's follow that to his end, pretend it's true. You could say, that's just silly. Ollie isn't made of fairies, so he must be made of something else, right? That's kind of a reduction of absurd and probably the worst example which has ever been made of that. But <laughs> And personally insulting. <laughs> Oh, he just walks out. <laughs> <laughs> so you can, by saying God, he's saying that, um, suppose God isn't the greatest being that can be conceived and he doesn't exist in reality. That would be absurd. So he must. That was just a key clause in there. But we'll break it down yeah. piece by piece, sir. Shall, right. we, shall we? Premise one. Premise one. God is the greatest thing we can think of. Oh, yep. Or yep. was it not? Well, oh, yeah. Sorry, God is greater than oh, yeah, which so, yeah. nothing Pre- greater can be conceived. Good. So it's re- the language is really important. He's picked every, every word is key. God is greater than which nothing greater can be conceived. So that nothing is nothing greater than God. That is Anselm's definition of God. Um, well, this is interesting. It's the concept of God, which a lot of religious believers are going to subscribe to. Now, there's a an article, I forget the name of the person, who tries to come up with a theology which is good for philosophy of religion. And the synopsis of that paper, I'll find it and link it in the, on the website, is um, Revelation Theology and Perfect Being Theology. Now, Revelation Theology is just the basis of what you have in the Bible. So if you're a Christian, you'll use the New Testament, and coupled with that, you're going to use Perfect Being Theology. So God, according to Christians, uh, uh, the select group of Christians that engage in philosophy of religion are going to say that God is the greatest being that could be conceived. I don't think there's I think even Dawkins is going to agree that God, the concept, is the greatest being that can be conceived. He disagrees that he exists, but the concept of God, in the same way that a unicorn, so what, I think we've done this example before, what's a unicorn? Um, that it's kind of a, an animal with the with a, a horse animal with a horn on its head. Okay, how many horns does this horse have to have? One. Why Normally you... one horn. No, why do you say normally? Surely it's always one, is it not? What I think it's makes... always one horn. Yeah, always I don't know horn? many unicorns. But how do we know that, Ali? We know that because of the word unicorn. So the definition of the animal is that the word uni means one, um, and the word corn comes from the Latin Latin for um, horn. Horn. Yeah, it's so one horn. Literally means one horn. So obviously, by definition, a unicorn needs at least one horn. Good. So. The concept of unicorn we all agree on. Regardless of whether we say unicorns exist, we can all agree on the concept of unicorn. Yeah. And so to engage in philosophy of religion, we have to have a common understanding of the concept of God that religious believers are going to say that's okay. Mm-hmm. And Anselm, as a Christian, as a, what is he, a Benedictine monk? Mm-hmm. Is yep. he a Benedictine monk? Yeah. He's going to say, you know, he's subscribing to Christianity and he's saying God is greater than which no- nothing greater could be conceived. That's a very... Um, widely accepted view of God within Christianity. So I don't think we can, no, we, criticisms in part four, you can, we can disagree with that if we need to. But, um, I think that's a fairly strong yeah. premise for the yeah. sake of moving forward. I don't know. Riding a unicorn while eating your favorite ice cream through space. 
which you know i don't know <laughs> well, about well, you yeah and then like god is and better god is than better that. than that yeah, yeah. you yeah. cannot yeah it is better god than is okay. that yeah really god tumble. is better than anything god is that you better can think. than that god is yeah. better than eating like being flying through space on a unicorn <laughs> you don't mean that that <laughs> wouldn't be amazing <laughs> okay. Okay. i mean that would be leave yeah. premise one we're happy with okay it. Yeah. i think yeah. we're okay so with this yeah. premise two god exists at least in the understanding do we all understand what god is in the understanding yeah so yes. in my own head i can think of this being yeah? yeah yeah okay yeah, we understand fine. we yeah. understand i understand God's it yeah great thing or he exists and he exists in the mind if we're discussing him he exists in the mind right premise three andy it's greater to exist in reality than in just the understanding good do we agree on that so absolutely i mean i can imagine sitting on unicorn flying through space eating ice cream but, but that would be, be much more better in real life or yeah okay yeah. that's a really good example yeah so it's better for things to exist than just exist in the mind we can agree on that, can't Absolutely. we? Yeah. yeah. I don't think anyone would disagree with that, I don't think. Yeah, so let's, like, perhaps, I know, <laughs> I love your example, but can we come up with one that's, like, more, more that, like, so what can you think of that you would really like that you could imagine actually being possible? What would, what's the thing that you want most, Jack? Uh, <laughs> um, okay, let me think. Um, this has now become a therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tell us what's how you feel, Jack. Moments? I'm imagining the new spicy wicked zinger meal from KFC. It's in my head. It's in my yeah. mind. Great. It's, a, it's, a, it's delicious in my mind. But wouldn't it be better if you actually had it and it was real? Well, 100%. And it would be even better if it was only £4.74. <laughs> Get yourself down to KFC. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. They murder chickens every day. <laughs> I think I'm just like, at first... I thought this, the whole advertising thing was silly. I'm just embracing it. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Andy? What do you, what can you imagine that you would really, really like to be better in real life? Ooh, uh, I'm just going to go because I'm, I'm hungry. I would like a, 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 a KFC just to keep it simple <laughs> again. KFC again. As well. <laughs> No. <laughs> no imagination here. I'm just, oh, I'm God, just hungry. Jesus okay, right. So it's better to exist <laughs> in reality than it is an understanding. Right. Here's the reductio ad absurdum. Here's the trick. Here's the, the tomfoolery. This is, this is the good play. Bit. This is the bit. Not tomfoolery. The, the <laughs> reductio ad absurdum. Right. Premise four. Suppose God only exists in understanding. Premise five. Then there is a greater conceivable being than God, one that exists in reality. So yeah. So just like KFC, or sitting on a unicorn flying through space. These things are great in our minds, just like God is in our mind. But by definition, he has to be better than that and has to exist in reality um, by the definition of the argument and the reasoning it's using. Mm -hmm. um, so therefore, God must exist. If you can imagine God, it's better if God was real. So therefore, it must be. Yeah, Ex exist. existence is better than non-existence. Yeah. Like, so when we're talking about perfection, existence is is part of that definition. Good, but remember, this is reduction out of sermon. He's saying, suppose God only exists in understanding, then there's a greater conceivable being than God. So he's saying, suppose that God only exists in understanding, then there would be a being that is better than God because it exists in reality. Us three included are mm -hmm. better than God in that respect, but God's the greatest being that can be conceived. So this is a contradiction, which is yeah. premise six. This is a contradiction. If there's a being which, if God only exists in understanding, it's a contradiction because he's not the greatest being that could be conceived. But premise one, he is the greatest being that nothing greater can be conceived. So our assumption was false. Here's a conclusion. So our assumption was false and God exists in reality. Cool? Yes. Cool. God, God exists? He has to, right? I, I'd say, well, he has to. Brilliant. Second formulation. So that was from the Proslogion 2, that God exists. Okay. The first formulation. But there's a second formulation of Anselm's argument from the Proslogion 3, that God exists necessarily. Could you kind of see the second formation, formulation as kind of like a redraft, kind of airing out some problems, maybe? I think it's almost like when re referring to the, the camp with the categorical imperative, it's just like, it's just a different way of saying the same thing, but you come to the same conclusion. Yeah. But like the logic is the same. So, like, I think it's just almost reword it, and it still works this way. If yeah. you if you if you prefer one or the other, it doesn't almost it almost doesn't matter. The arguments came in two by two. Hurrah, hurrah! Oh. <laughs> Second formulation is greater. Okay, first premise. Should we break this one down? Mm -hmm. I think as well. The second argument from Proslogion three: uh, it's greater not to be conceivable as not existing in reality than to be conceivable as not existing in reality. Suppose God can be conceived not to exist in reality. Then there is a greater conceivable being than God, one that cannot be conceived not to exist in reality. 
but this is a contradiction. And then your conclusion, so our um, supposition was false and God cannot be conceived not to exist in reality. Good. So God must be a necessary being is the upshot of that, isn't it? He can't just be a contingent being. So what's a, should we just break down those two key words? What's a necessary being? A necessary being is something that has to exist. Has to exist. So a contingent being, let's take Andy as our example. How's Andy a contingent being? What's Andy contingent on? <laughs> um, I, I don't know, actually. Well, I would be contingent on, like, my parents having brought me into the world. Oh, yeah. the, cause, the causality exist. of Andy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, the, con- the, the contingency of Andy is that he was born. Yeah, and that he was, con- like, say Andy was, um, Andy's parents conceived him a month earlier, Andy wouldn't be here. He's contingent on the moment, on that particular sperm, that particular egg, that particular day, on his parents meeting on that day, or not. <laughs> well, they had we get the on idea, the day, we get the idea, Jack. <laughs> 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 yes, you don't have to talk about Andy's conception. We get it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just to emphasize how the how uh, contingent it is, though, that it's a you know if he his parents took him on his dad took his mom on a date a week earlier, then perhaps they would <laughs> on that particular date, and his grandparents and their grandparents, then the four point five billion years. Are we going to say is it four point five yeah. billion years old? Ish. So all those things were contingent on Andy being here, sat in mm-hmm. front of a microphone, and you enjoying his voice in your ears now. Well like, done, Andy. I did well. <laughs> you did really well to get from yeah. all the contingent things, like every single contingent event that has brought you here today. is incredible. And to the people listening as well, think of all, all the things in your life which you're contingent on to the moment you, from the morning to now, that to listen to for your decision to make, to listen to this podcast, then chuck it back 4.5 billion years and think of all the events that led up to you being here now. You're contingent. You're not necessary. <laughs> yes. If you didn't exist, if you didn't exist, the world would still be doing its thing without you. Without us. We're not just going existential crisis mode. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. Just deal with it. <laughs> it's true. So you might as well get over it. We should just do it like a therapy podcast. Right, so a necessary being is one that has to exist. So God yes. could not have not existed. Absolutely, yeah. So that's the argument. Um, so should we break down this one in a little more detail? It's greater not to be conceivable as not existing in reality than to be conceivable as not existing in reality. That's a mouthful. Let's, mm-hmm. let's sum that up in English. Mm-hmm. So I think everyone would agree that if something exists in reality, it's far better than something you can imagine. You can sit around and think, oh, I really want a PS4. But if you actually have a PS4, you're probably going to be, that's far better. Yeah. Boom. So it's better to be a necessary being than a contingent being. If God is the greatest being that can be conceived, he's not contingent on all these events prior to him. He's just necessary. Um, so suppose that God, the reductio ad absurdum, part two, suppose, premise two, suppose God can be conceivable not to exist in reality. Now that would just be absurd because then there'll be one which doesn't, isn't a contingent being, that is a necessary being. This is a contradiction, so God cannot be conceived to be a contingent being. He must be a necessary being. God's an necessary being, can we all agree? According to the argument, yes. We'll put a copy of the argument in its simplest, in Anselm's form on the website, just so you can refer to it if you need to as we go on. Um, but he's really strict with his language. He's got a, every, every word matters in this argument. He's picked them extremely carefully. Um, so as to not debunk, there's no room to debunk it. He's trying to get it watertight. He's a philosopher. He's trying to get it as watertight as he can sorry to use the same word again so no one can say this isn't the case but this leads us nicely on to part two Guinello and his response do you want to jump into part two do you want to say anything else before we jump into part two no okay good (laughs) part two Guinello and the island uh our key inquiry question for this section who was Guinello and why was he on an island (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so misleading yeah interesting question <laughs> good question <laughs> that's a good question no no i like no, that's that. good i like it okay. uh, right uh who was he then that's a good one uh do you want me to start with this yeah cool um so he was another benedictine monk uh i, I mean he was a contemporary of of Ansam, so he, he they did know each other and and that's why he kind of replies so he he reads through Ansam's argument and he thinks to himself hmm I believe in God, but I'm not entirely sure if, if this is, this is quite right. Um, so, so, you know, he, 
it's interesting that his response to it is is called on behalf of the fool so he's he's kind of playing devil's advocate here and so he obviously as i said he believes in god but he's trying to, he's going to say right let's let's put ourselves in the well, place who, of the who's, fool who's the fool who's what who's he referring to as the fool what's a fool you know, well, the you fool know. the fool is the, the atheist yeah. the non-believer oh right okay yeah so cool. uh, so he's so he's saying that like right from from like, let's just kind of give give the atheist his peace here and see why why he might actually disagree with this idea and uh essentially what he says is that like using this logic you can try and prove that any perfect thing exists and as we said uh, he uses the idea of an island to try and prove that this logic doesn't really work so um, andy before we go any further can you describe to us please the most perfect island yeah let's do that oh it's an amazing What's your perfect my island? perfect island well it might be i have a lot of love on this island <laughs> <laughs> I knew. I, I had no idea that was going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't even see it going. Perfect <laughs> island is Love Island. Yeah. <laughs> when there's like a mansion with a nice pool, <laughs> and like there's a bunch of there's like six guys and six girls, and they're all just getting along. Well, they're not really, but. <laughs> Okay. Um, but let, well, that's my perfect island. But um, oh, like, your perfect island, right? My perfect island would be a more advanced version of Tracy Island, because I had a Tracy Island model when I was younger, where the Thunderbirds all live. So I'm going to have Tracy Island, but it's going to have a massive mountain, so I can ski in the morning, kind of relax on the beach in the afternoon, and then fly a Thunderbird in the evening. I think that would be my perfect awesome. island. Yeah, that's yeah, cool. That's a pretty damn perfect island. I can't really top that. My perfect island. Is there a film called The Island? There is. There's a film, yeah, there is, but do you know? It's not really it, perfect, though. I'm thinking, <laughs> you want to, you want thinking, thinking of, of the, the sci-fi beach. one where, oh, no, not okay. the beach. No, That's I wouldn't, also wouldn't not perfect. The, <laughs> it's pretty perfect. Well, it's not perfect. It was perfect. It appears perfect. The island itself would be perfect with it. Well, I think we're, if we're taking the things that are on it, too. Yeah. The Island is a sci-fi film where people are biologically cloned. So it's a sci-fi world where, in the future, people... Um, need organs so there's this island full of clones of themselves they pay a lot of money so when they lose a lung they can just get one of their harvested beings and take one of their lungs so yeah that would be my turn basically island. the plot of one island go as well. full of clones um, an island full of me clones also while we're discussing the islands if i don't mention lost then i feel oh, like okay. i'm lost like, no, that would be it. my favorite I change, island. I change, I change. <laughs> yeah okay it's definitely the best island it is yeah an incredible show. yeah okay. watch so it the know. lost island from lost Jack is now going to explain um, the argument from the French Benedictine monk, Cornello. So we imagine an island with that, uh, that which uh, no island greater can, uh, how you say, uh, exist in reality. So uh, the island exists at least in the understanding, and it is greater to exist in reality than it is to exist in understanding. So suppose that the island only exists in our understanding. Then there would be a conceivable island that exists in reality. But this is a contradiction. So our assumption is false and the island exists in reality. Great. Never let we? me do that again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, that was pretty good. Actually, there, I was like, I ne- <laughs> yeah. can't wait for this argument to end. It's quite a good <laughs> argument. I ruined okay. it. Yeah. Well, so yeah. So, so, once again, okay. should we just start with, let's go through each bit. bit and, and so we'll start with the first premise. Imagine an island than which a greater island cannot exist in reality. So it's an island that which nothing greater can, can be, be conceived. conceived. Yeah. So so no greater island could um, exist. Mm-hmm. And the island exists at least in our understanding, doesn't it? You can picture the perfect island. Yeah. You can yeah. think of your, uh, you can think of Tracy Island, you can think of the Lost yeah. Island. Also, I'm taking the Lost Island one. So we can all imagine our perfect island, the greatest mm-hmm. island that can be conceived. Yeah. And it is greater to exist in reality, just as Anton said, uh, than it is just in the understanding so yeah. you're you have your perfect island in your head but wouldn't that be better if that perfect island existed in reality mm. yeah i mean the deductive reasoning of this argument again makes sense but basically what he's saying is that you can use this kind of argument to prove the existence of anything yeah, really so- and that makes it real which obviously is not so sub island for um for a hamburger so Imagine an, a hamburger, which nothing greater can be conceived. Well, obviously, it would be the double wimpy deluxe hamburger. No greater burger can be conceived. But then if you come up to me and say, you know, there's there's this hamburger, which is a rustler's hamburger, and you say, no, this one's better. It's the greatest that can be conceived. No hamburger is greater. Any of the exists in the mind, this one's better because it exists in reality. You can pick, you can substitute island for any. Imagine any yeah. perfect thing. But you also... 
Should we pick another example rather than hamburger? Do you want to think of one which is more Peter Singer friendly, just in case he's listening? <laughs> just, <laughs> which he totally is. Which he definitely way. lost him. That's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, he was a fan until now. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing that lost that's, him. <laughs> that's the point where he said, no, this isn't hard. This isn't tough enough philosophy for me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> idiot. Ruining this craft. For me. Okay. Pick another example. Yeah. What of something you cannot. Imagine yeah, greater. just absolutely anything. But just think of an object. A plate of coffee. A plate of coffee. Okay. <laughs> like just a perfect plate. Like just <laughs> whatever, plate. whatever. It just yeah. needs to be an object. Okay, just a plate. Object, yeah. So a plate. Yeah. Imagine a plate which nothing greater can be conceived. This it'd, it'd this plate a... exists at least in your understanding, but it's the greatest plate that can be conceived. So um, it exists. In re- it's better to exist in reality than in understanding. Now, suppose this plate only exists in understanding. Well, that would be absurd because there'll be a plate that exists in reality. But this plate is the greatest plate that can be conceived. So the assumption was false, and the plate exists in reality. Yeah. yeah. So we, we, got we, to, we could yeah, we could use lots of different examples, but yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the main criticism is that you can kind of reason things into existence. Whoa, whoa, whoa! No criticisms. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No, like, like no, yeah, right, so Gornillo is, is that he's oh, criticized. His criticism. Yes. Yeah. So his criticism is is that using the Sorry, logic yeah. that Ansem presents that you can prove that any perfect thing exists, literally just by the definition of saying no, that than which nothing greater can be conceived, uh, allows you to then say, well, anything that exists is better than not existing. Yeah. Therefore, whatever I want exists. Okay, we got to premise four last time before we did. So um, we got to... Uh, it's great to exist in reality than understanding. And the reduction out absurdum comes in premise four. Suppose the island only exists in understanding. Then there would be a greater conceivable island, one that exists in reality, but that's absurd. So that's where that absurdity clause comes in. He's following the exact same argument as Anselm, but just substituting God for island. And that's all he's doing to his argument. Yeah. Um, and fortunately, we're in the position where because um, um, Ganillo was a peer of Anselm, Anselm actually responded to what he said. So you actually have a philosophical discussion here, which is um, kind of back and forth. So now we'll look at what Anselm says back to Grinello in terms of, well, I mean, Anselm pretty much says that Grinello kind of misses the point of the argument slightly. Well, should we start, should we start off straight away with, um, his letter back or his response actually starts off with, since it is not the fool against who I am spoke in my tract who takes me up, but one who is, though speaking on the fool's behalf, is an orthodox Christian and no fool, it will suffice that I reply to the Christian. So a nice ouch. <laughs> He's like, I wouldn't reply to a fool or well, atheist, but I'll reply to you, Grinnell. <laughs> so he does reply to him. Shall I just read straight from his response? Go for it. Yeah. Um, so quite quote from Anselm in his direct response to Grinello. He says, I reply as follows. If that than which a greater cannot be thought is neither understood nor thought of and is neither in the mind nor in thought, then it is evident that either God is not that which nothing greater can be thought, or it is not understood nor thought of, and is not in the mind nor in thought. So, sorry, that that sounds like a lot of words jumbled up into a big mess. Uh, but I don't think it even knows talks not the hell in his response. I think that's just a um, something I've highlighted in my notes and then read out on a podcast and then regretted five seconds later. <laughs> So Anselm responds with what? What's Anselm's response? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Well, 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 Anselm obviously says that he's missed the point yeah. of the argument. Um, and this is where you kind of get into the definition of what a necessary being is, really. Um, so kind of Anselm's saying that an island is not a necessary being. An island is just an island that you can imagine um, in your brain or in your mind. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas God is a necessary being. Um and obviously, by his definition, um, he he is quite sincere in saying that that's obviously part of the the second form of the argument: the fact that God is necessary, um, and obviously the greatest thing we can imagine. Therefore, he kind of has to exist. Yeah, and there's the issue, and we actually highlighted it perfectly when we said, like, what's what's our own perfect island? Well, there's that subject subjective nature of what makes a perfect island whereas god is just perfect like there is no you can't nobody can have a different idea of a perfect being because it is everyone has the same thing it doesn't work with anything else because somebody's perfect island will be completely different to the others yeah so god by our concept is a being which nothing greater can be conceived that's a part of the concept of god as a single horn on a unicorn is a concept of a unicorn now a perfect island 
doesn't necessarily, you can't just lump on that extra clause that it's the greatest thing that be conceived onto everyday things. You're missing the point. This is encapsulated in the concept of God. The whole essence of God is being greater than anything that can be conceived. And Grinnell has just missed the point. He's missed the bus and he's running after it, chanting Island, Island, Island. And he's like, screw you, Grinnell. On the way to heaven for me <laughs> on this <laughs> <Yeah>. magic bus. <laughs> A good analogy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> okay. So it might be worth pointing out at this point as well that Anselm isn't the only person to use this form of reasoning to prove the existence of God. Um, in episode three, um, which you should check out, um, we were talking about uh, René Descartes, who was a um, uh, another kind of a priori philosopher. Um, and he also agreed that the definition of God that he uses to argue the existence in his meditations um, is something that you that is perfect, that you something that you cannot imagine anything being more perfect. Um, and again, uses a form of ontological argument to prove the existence of God. Uh, so again, another example. Should we set out the argument? Should we say his argument? Descartes one. Mm-hmm. Yes. Descartes' version of the ontological argument um, is as follows. So God is by definition perfect, as some of the premises we already had. Um, an, Im- an imperfect God would not be God. So if God is perfect, he must contain all perfections, including the perfection of existence. If he did not exist, he would not be perfect. So he must exist. Um, so he considered a triangle uh, adding up to 180 degrees. So Descartes argued that there were some qualities that an object necessarily had or else it would not be that object. So equally, the notion of a hill demands the idea of a valley. In the same way, existence cannot be separated from the concept of God. Cool. Okay. Good. Yeah, so uh, the corners of a triangle, 180 degrees, they must add up to. That's just a part of being a triangle. They can't not add up to 180 degrees. They just cease to be a triangle if it doesn't have that that um, that property of, yeah, of a, a predicate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the so predicate the, of a triangle. Yeah, yeah the, so... Just to make that clear, ex- existence for God is a defining predicate because God is perfect and therefore existence is part of perfection. We should have that as a um, take what Andy just said and just play that for everything he says. When he, he during the criticisms, he's just like, God is perfect. Andy, can I say for the recording, God, uh, God, Andy literally has two books in front of him, the God delusion and God is not great. <laughs> That was Andy's preparatory reading. For itself. <laughs> um, and this, and you could argue as well that this is a strength to the argument because you've got Descartes, who, who in we realised in um, episode three, brought everything, stripped everything back down to his most basic principle, and from that he's managed to build himself back up all the way to the existence of God. Um, so, again, we've got two very influential philosophers who are using very similar arguments. Um, the, on, the ontological arguments to kind of argue the existence of God. Yeah, although weirdly, Descartes didn't mention Anselm at all, mm. which is... I mean, just no like we mentioned nobody yeah, when we referenced like, in our yeah, podcast, so we get away with problems there. Descartes gets away with it, I'm sure yeah, we can. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. If we end up sat behind a sat behind a, a jury. Do you sit behind a jury? Sat in front of the jury. <laughs> sat, sat behind the jury. <laughs> like some creepy <laughs> yeah. stalker. Creepy on a jury. If we're ever being creeped on by a jury, oh, they're yeah. saying, you should have referenced... Um, this time for I'm not going to tell people. <laughs> Should we just start that again? That's it. See you later. <laughs> Andy, what do you like about the ontological argument? Well, I think I like the fact that it's it's simplicity, isn't it? That it follows Occam's razor. That it's um, and it's it is tightly worded in the sense that like it's hard to actually say where it goes wrong. Like you look, you, you're reading through it and you can accept the, the first premise and the idea of existence as a defining predicate of, of a perfect being. So when you follow it and you think, yeah, that kind of has to work on first glance. Um, as long as you're understanding each part, when you get to the end, it does kind of feel like, yeah, wow, this is, this is good. On the Occam's razor point, we mentioned parsimony quite a lot, haven't we? So it's better to, um, have a simpler, a sim- simplicity is an indication of truth. It's a good indicator of truth. And to say that, um, God is omni everything, he's the greatest being that can be conceived is simpler than saying, oh, he's perfect up to this point, or he's, um, he's omni everything or the best being to this point. So you may as well say he's all these things. He's the greatest possible being. I think that definition is really good and strong. And um, Anselm's taken that to its end here and said that this thing must exist. If we're taking this understanding of God, then he necessarily exists. What are your thoughts, Ollie? 
Yeah, I like it. Yeah, I think it's... Uh... I'm not a massive fan of a priori arguments, really, personally. Oof, don't open a can of worms. I know. Come on. But, but yeah, but, 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 yeah, but, but, why, but as thing. an a priori argument. But as an a priori but, argument, yeah, yeah I, I have no problem with it. Cool. Look at that. To the person that criticizes for being atheist, who's going know, to as a, as a fool, <laughs> as a fool, <laughs> yeah, who's, who's a going fool to, now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to this episode of the Pan Sidecast, we hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We've really enjoyed it, and if you enjoy the next episode, make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes or access our website www.thepansidekiss.com for information on when the new podcast will be released, and just to get the full round experience and all the reading too. Find us on Twitter. Share it with your friends, your loved ones, and your pets. <laughs>